This is episode number 10 with Daniel Vitalis. Welcome to the Melissa Ambrosini Show. I'm your host, Melissa, best-selling author of Mastering Your Mean Girl, and I'm here to remind you that love is sexy, healthy is liberating, and wealthy isn't a dirty word. Each week, I'll be getting up close and personal with thought leaders from around the globe to uncover the habits, habits, mindsets, mindsets, tools, and rituals that they have used to become world class so that you can create epic change in your own life and become the best version of yourself possible. Are you ready, beautiful? Daniel is the host of the Rewild Yourself podcast and founder of surthrival.com. He is also a writer, public speaker, entrepreneur, and lifestyle pioneer in the sphere of human health, personal development, and strategic living. He's especially interested in the meeting place of ancestral health and lifestyle design. Daniel was also featured in the epic documentary, Hungry for Change. Now, Daniel and I connected many years ago and have been great friends since. He is one of my go to health expert and is quite possibly one of the nicest and smartest humans on the planet. He is a wealth of knowledge, inspiration, and a massive ball of love, which is why I'm so excited to share this interview with you today. Now, there's a lot of podcasts out there on paleo and veganism, raw, and everything in between. There's so much information and it can feel overwhelming and confusing. It's taken me years to figure out what's right for me. And my hopes with this show and this episode in particular is to expose you to the people who can really help fast track your health and healing and growth. And Daniel is definitely one of those people. So why should you listen to this episode? Well, from my perspective, Daniel has the greatest perspective on this topic. And on a personal note, there's no one I have listened to more on this topic than Daniel. So in this interview, we chat about Daniel's story and how he went from a raw vegan for 10 years to hunting his own food, the types of food he hunts, consuming animal products and spirituality, the importance of fats, which fats are actually good for you and how they can increase your IQ, why we all need B12, where we can get it and how a vegan diet lacks it, why we need to know the source of our food, the most nutrient dense food on the planet, why he doesn't set an alarm clock in the morning, how we can cultivate more community in our life plus so much more. Everything that Daniel and I mention will be in the show notes. All you have to do is head to melissaambrosini.com forward slash 10 and you can get everything that we mention. Now, I am so excited for you guys to hear this interview with this beautiful human, Daniel Vitalis. Daniel, welcome. I am so excited to have you here with us today. Hey, thanks so much for having me on. Before we dive in, can you please share what you had for breakfast with us this morning? (laughs) All right. This morning, let's see what I have for breakfast. I created an acorn brownie this morning, something like between a pancake and a brownie uh, based on acorn flour that I harvested from red oaks here on the landscape. And uh, that had a little bit of egg and uh, wild maple syrup. Oh my gosh, (laughs) that honestly sounds so delicious. It's really, really good. I tell people about eating acorns and it's like they ask, well, how do you do it? And I describe the process and then most people kind of glaze over and go like, that sounds complicated. But but once you get through how to process acorns, I think they are one of the most satisfying foods on earth. Probably Mm, Sounds delicious. I'm coming over for that. (laughs) It's going to take you a little while to get here, I think. Yeah. I love your story. It's so inspiring. In the show intro, I mentioned that you are the person that I have personally spent the most hours listening to on podcasts. Come on, really? Yeah, absolutely. Wow. And you are my health expert go-to for my husband and I. (laughs) And I don't know if I've told you this, but you were actually on our honeymoon with us. So we listened to (laughs) every single episode that 
you did with the One Radio Network. Wow. This was about three years ago now. We became obsessed with listening to you share your wisdom and your knowledge on the One Radio Network. And we just absorbed as much Daniel Vitalis as oh. we possibly could. <laughs> and we've been friends now for a couple of years and I'm so grateful to have you in my life and have you as this health expert that I can turn to. And you have been on such a journey and your your story is so inspiring and you've gone from this raw vegan for over 10 years to now hunting your own food. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey? Yeah, well, I've always been really interested in the idea of human wildness. I think uh, growing up, being kind of immersed in American culture uh, during the 80s and the 90s um, and feeling really nature divorced um, and feeling really disconnected from the kind of uh, terrestrial spirituality I think that human beings really crave. I was always just sort of on the search and I was really impacted as a kid kind of looking through National Geographic magazines. You know, we had a stack of them around the house and I would see tribal, indigenous tribal people depicted as living in their traditional life way. I, I assume now a lot of that was more manufactured. You know, I think a lot of times for those kind of photo shoots, they probably said, take your Reeboks off. Uh, but I would see those images and I would think, wow, those are sovereign free people. And I always really craved that. What I thought then was backward in time. I sort of see it differently now as like forward into the future, but but I saw it as like an opportunity to start to regain some of my internal wildness. And so I went on a journey with food um, when I was quite young. I started probably about age 16. And I started to work my way back to what I thought was a really natural diet. I got waylaid for a lot of years by raw foods and veganism and um, some of those uh, what appear at first glance to be more natural diets. Now I understand they're actually not, um, strangely. But that journey led me about, like you said, about 10 years of being a vegan and eating raw foods and then kind of hit the wall with that, as I think so many people do. Was really lucky to come across the work of Weston Price, uh, the author of uh, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, which was basically the story of a dentist who traveled the world looking at traditional peoples and uh, intact indigenous groups or groups that had only been outside their life way for a couple of generations. And he studied their teeth and he studied um, their facial and bone structure and what they ate. And what he found was that when they lived their traditional life way, they were free, radically free of diseases that we tend to think of now as just sort of being a normal part of living like uh, cavities um, and the general bone deformities that we think of as natural faces today, uh, it, but also a, a suite of other diseases like cancer and heart disease and diabetes and all these things that uh, afflict civilized people today. Um, and that kind of got me really interested in what did natural people eat. And that led me to what I would call today, like the homo sapiens diet, you know, really looking at outside of all these diet fads and crazes that we all get so caught up in and swept up by. I mean, there's always new ones as everybody knows. Um, what underlies that? What's the actual diet of our species? And I guess, you know, a fundamental theme for me was the knowledge that human beings, homo sapiens are a type of animal. Uh, native to this planet, and therefore we have some kind of diet that we are adapted to naturally. And I wanted to work my way back to that. And so uh, hunting today for me is just one aspect of how I'm able to get some of my calories off the landscape. I think it's really unrealistic for most of us today to you know, become hunter gatherers in a traditional sense, but there is what me and, and many people in my circle call the neo aboriginalist, the Homo sapiens neo aboriginalist, the new aboriginal, and we are restructuring diets off the landscape where we live. And so that's what I'm doing today. That sounds amazing. So, what are some of the things that you hunt? I'm really interested in animal foods in general. So, I think when people imagine hunting, probably the things, I mean, what comes to mind for you? I imagine deer comes to mind. Mm -hmm. That's like one of the things people think of deer, moose, elk, caribou, things like that. But, but I think about hunting as human predation upon any of the kingdom animalia, right? So all of the animals. And I want to be clear here. I'm a, I, I classify myself as like a conscientious omnivore. So, I mean, I don't just hunt, but, but forage plants and harvest mushrooms and ferment things with bacteria. So I eat from all the kingdoms of life. But when I think about animals, I'd start really small scale. Like I'll, I have certain insects that are in my diet. That's a type of hunting, but a lot of people might not think about it like that. But you know, there's animals in my diet, like grasshopper, dragonfly, June bug, things like that ant, bee, 
Um, getting up from there, I would say there's mollusks in my diet, snails and clams and oysters and mussels. And uh, working up from there would be fishes, from small fishes like our, our native char here, brook trout and small sea run smelt, all the way up to larger fish like uh, haddock and pollock and cod that I catch offshore here. Um, and then on the mammal side of things, I'm hunting everything from small game like gray squirrel and uh, snowshoe hare on up to uh, deer and uh, bear, um, also birds like duck and turkey. Um, so kind of a broad spectrum of things. And my goal really is to be a generalist hunter and not get kind of pigeonholed into any one thing that I hunt. So I really believe a foundation of of traditional diets and what should be the foundation of our diet today, though it's not for, for most people living in the westernized nations of the world, is variety and diversity and seasonality. And so rather than I just hunt this or I just hunt that, uh, my goal is to, to eat as broadly from the landscape, eating as many different things and bringing in as many novel genetics into my diet as I can. Um, and, and let me just add one more thing to that, which is that I really believe that one of the hallmarks of a wild food diet, one of the things that makes it really so special is that each food is really another species. And that means that your diet isn't just about what you eat. I mean, I think that's a very egocentric way, but it's an ecocentric view. And it's what species do I have a dietary relationship with? And so each of those animals that I just mentioned before, these aren't just, you know, commodities that I prey upon. These are species that I not only eat, but have to learn about their ecology, their conservation, their natural history, where to find them, when they are best harvested. And uh, each one is, is literally like a spiritual relationship. And so when I think about my network of friends, you know, they're not just human beings, but they're non-human persons as well. And that would include some of the animals that I just mentioned. So beautiful. I hear it all the time that people really struggle with consuming animal products. Why is it that spirituality and consuming animal products for food don't always go together? What are your thoughts on this? I think that's bunk spirituality. Um, I think it's it's fake manufactured modern civilized human spirituality that comes from nature divorcement. <laughs> so, uh, and and I say that from having lived longer in it than most people make it. So I'm not saying that like as an attack against anybody who feels that way. I'm saying it as somebody who did feel that way. Um, but now I look at it and it's kind of silly to me. Um, when we look at, you know, what's what's most interesting to me about that, Melissa, is that I would say that most people who feel that way also feel very connected to native spirituality. So they'll find themselves tinkering with, with Native American or North American spiritual traditions or tinkering with South American spiritual shamanic traditions, maybe uh, Aboriginal Australian spiritual views. And they'll mix all those things together in what we might call the kind of the new age porridge of spirituality. And yet they fail to see that all of those groups I just mentioned were consummate predators of their landscape, eating a gigantic suite of animals uh, from all throughout the ecosystems where they lived. And so it's funny, we turn to those people for spiritual insight. And yet, uh, then we look at what they did and we somehow don't think they were doing anything wrong, but somehow it's wrong if we do it today. I would say what's actually not spiritual is self-abuse and self-flagellation. And so one of the things I think veganism is, is which, which I would say is a religion. It's almost like an apology to nature for the things that industrialization has done. Mm -hmm. So individuals take on a tremendous uh, load of guilt for the colonization and industrialization of the world, and then think that if they starve themselves, they can somehow purify themselves of that guilt and shame. The problem is they further estrange themselves from nature in the process and undermine the health of future generations. So I don't think anybody thinks there's something spiritual about starving children. I don't think anybody thinks there's anything spiritual about reducing the IQ of children, but veganism does that. So it actually has negative impacts on the next generation. So not only do people find themselves sort of divorced from nature, but they also impact the next generation. My friend Arthur Haynes um, says that any the the there's a tendency right now, what he says, for us to qualify a diet um, based on the kind of longevity it can produce. 
which is incredibly egocentric, right? It's all about the individual, like what can I accomplish in my lifetime? He said the higher standard for a diet is what impact does it have on future generations? What kind of children does it create? We're so focused on ourselves that we're not actually really thinking about what does this diet do to kids in the future. So not only the kids we have, but like the kids we might have later on. So ultimately, veganism is an untested diet. Uh, When it has been tested, it's had negative health outcomes for children. Therefore, I don't see how this can be a spiritual diet. And um, I don't think anything that takes us outside of our eco niche and human beings, eco-niche is one of omnivory. So if we take ourselves out of that, I think we're actually being kind of anti-spiritual. And I think what a lot of people call spirituality today is it's kind of a sexed up yogic ego trip that (laughs) somehow has been foisted upon us as a spiritual path. But uh, upon close scrutiny, I think that kind of unravels a little bit. Yeah. It's funny, you go to India and you think Ayurveda is a very powerful thing, but they are very into their ghee and they place a lot of importance on ghee. Did they know something that we forgot along the way? Of course they did. Of course they did. Mm -hmm. Well, we haven't forgotten it. I mean, you find butter in almost every house in Australia and in the United States. But some people have forgotten that. But also I want to point out, with all the respect due to the people of India and all the respect due to Ayurveda, this is a very new thing. I mean, we could be like, Ayurveda, it's one of the oldest medical systems of civilized people. But remember, civilized people have only been around for about six to 10,000 years. And human beings in our modern form have been around for 200,000 years. So just because, so so 6,000, that's 5% of human uh, development in our modern form. That's not hominin development that goes back millions of years. But just in our recent form, in our current form, Ayurveda didn't come around till about last week. And, you know, the human epic. And so while it has many uh, merits, um, it is a medical system for a civilization that preyed heavily upon its ecosystems and decimated its populations over time, sorry, decimated its population of indigenous peoples, damaged its landscape, uh, domesticated and enslaved animals and plants. I mean, so I, I wouldn't look personally, I don't look to India as a as a um, some kind of bastion of of spiritual progress. In fact, I would say it's kind of the opposite because it disrupts the land base and that therefore disrupts the land base of indigenous animals in favor of domesticated animals. It disrupts forests and, um, and natural uh, plant communities in favor of domesticated plants. Uh, so really, Ayurveda is just the medical wing of one more civilization's war against nature. So, I mean, we can look at it and think it's the the thing is is that people practicing Ayurveda do not have better health outcomes than indigenous people had living in their traditional life way. So it might be an improvement upon the medical system that most of us grew up in. I would say it surely is. I'd say Ayurveda would be a, a much better system than the than the current medical system that is you know conventionally available. But neither of them can really compare to the health health outcomes that traditional peoples had throughout time living uh, on wild diets and wild landscapes. It's really interesting. I want to go back to what you were saying before about the reducing of the IQ, because this I found really, really interesting. I've never really even been a coffee drinker, and my husband finally convinced me to try this whole Bulletproof coffee. And if you're not familiar with Bulletproof coffee and the concept of it, it's basically a good quality mold-free coffee coffee blended with grass-fed butter, MCT oil. And I also add some other goodies in there like collagen and cinnamon and turmeric and bone broth protein. And that's now my breakfast, which leads me to my question about fats. Fats like butter have had such a bad rap for so long. Can you speak about the importance of saturated fats? Because for me, in my vegan experiment, I ended up with no menstrual cycle. I had eczema all over my body. I had hives and a whole other host of gut and health issues, which I won't bore you with. So what was going on? And is this common? A lot of things have happened politically. You know, nutrition in the developed world is more political than it is actually nutritional. Um, Fats have always been the staple, the real like substance of homo sapiens diets or, or one, a a very significant player, not just saturated fats, uh, which are really important to us, but also um, the 
omega-3 fats, particularly the long chain versions of those fats, which we find in animal products almost exclusively. Um, we have a significant need for fat. Now, a couple things about fat that are important to know. One is that fat is far more calorie dense than carbohydrate, than uh, protein, or than alcohol, which is also another um, uh, source of calories. So when you're looking uh, at foods in general, you're getting, you're getting carbohydrates giving you about four calories per gram. Proteins giving you about four calories per gram. Ethanol, alcohol gives you about seven calories per gram. Fats give you nine calories per gram. Now, a lot of people think about reducing their calories and that's because they live off the glut of domesticated diets, which are too high in calories and too low in nutrition. But when you start looking at what it takes to get food off of a wild landscape, you start to cherish calories because they're a little harder to come by. So anything dense in calories becomes really, really important. Now, all through human history, fats have been crucial. I mean, hunters here, when they first came over the Bering Land Strait or the Bering Land Bridge into North America, were hunting the megafauna here, like, for instance, the mammoths that were here. There were several species of mammoths. These animals are up to 50% fat. Fats have been, saturated animal fats have been part of our diet forever. However, heart disease, which has been associated with lipids due to the what's called the lipid hypothesis, which is very recent, heart disease, this is a new phenomenon. This this wasn't experienced by uh, traditional peoples, ancestral peoples in the past. This is a new thing. Saturated fat became the culprit due to some really bad science and due to some political pressure. I think it's important to understand that there was a big push to get polyunsaturated plant oils. These would be oils like cottonseed oil, canola oil, uh, corn oil, um, oils like that. Uh, soy oil would be the other big one safflower oil, sunflower oil, all of these seed oils, they weren't consumed in the past in this way, right? These foods at, in their seed form have been parts of diets around the world for a long time, and, and that doesn't pose a significant problem. However, pressing them for their oils yields an oil we call a polyunsaturated fat that is incredibly volatile. Um, it becomes oxidized in the presence of oxygen, of heat, and of light. And so what ends up happening is we produce these novel rancid oils that uh, are leading to heart disease and cardiovascular diseases. And so an interesting thing happened. There was political pressure to push saturated fats out and replace them uh, with these polyunsaturated oils, which are very cheap to produce and very easy to produce in quantity. That part is more political. As saturated fats were pushed out of our diet, uh, and when I say that, I mean fats like lard, which was a, a very common cooking oil, tallow, another common cooking oil, butter, another common cooking oil, and coconut oil, also very common cooking oil in the past, were replaced with soy, canola, cottonseed, corn oil, and the incidence of heart attack has gone up significantly. It's funny, the role of saturated fats in history have been to provide the energy we need metabolically to live on natural landscapes. Polyunsaturated fats are cheaper, uh, they are damaging, they are new foods, they not really existed in the past, uh, and they've led to tremendous uh, poor health outcomes. So we do need saturated fats in a significant way. There is no evidence that saturated fats lead to clogging of the arteries, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, this is absolute myth that ha has been promulgated by the American Medical Association and others, but it's not true. Um, and here's like the litmus test. Rather than getting kind of swayed all the time in the wind by new emerging studies and so-called evidence, we need to always vet new evidence by the past. So we have to ask ourselves, wait a second, if saturated fat leads to heart attacks, how is it that all of these people all through the last 200,000 years of our our individual species evolution, how have we eaten it that whole time but we didn't have that health outcome? We had we 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 see healthy children. We see no heart disease. We see almost no cancer. We see no diabetes. We don't even see cavities in these people in any significant numbers, and they consume tremendous amounts of saturated fat. Then we push saturated fats out of our diet, amp up the polyunsaturated oils, which are get still get called heart healthy, and we see a tremendous uptick. Um, in these exact diseases that it's supposed to um, be preventing. So I think on the ground level, what a lot of us saw was the movement of foods like butter out of the diet and bringing in foods like um, 
margarine, which is a polyunsaturated oil. And I'll point out this too. If you think about a polyunsaturated oil, these are, again, those vegetable oils. They're very liquidy at room temperature. And in order to make them behave like saturated fat, what we started to do is hydrogenate them. So essentially by adding hydrogen molecules, you take a liquid fat and you make it solid so it behaves like lard or tallow or coconut oil, uh, but is now rancid and filled with trans fats. And so I think there's a, 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 a large scale abandonment of the lipid hypothesis of disease now happening. People are moving away from that. And we see um, this almost cultish thing happening around butter and bacon right now, right? And when I was growing up and probably when you were growing up, bacon and butter were probably Probably um, if you would ask me to list the five like unhealthiest foods people ate when I was a teenager, I would have said uh, high on those lists would have been bacon and butter. Now these are health foods. You know, I had a friend who uh, went away for a period of time and he was really out of contact with news media and all of that for, for three years. And he came back and said, Daniel, what have I missed? And I said, well, not a lot except that bacon's a health food now. <laughs> so I think um, it, that we are stepping now away from that idea that fats are bad for us. And I think also people know now that fats don't actually make you fat. In fact, fats contribute to leaner body mass. And higher IQ. <laughs> and higher IQ. Let's talk for a second about, if we can, about uh, DHA and yes. uh, the fats that we find in marine animals. Because I think that's probably as or more important. And um, one of the things about vegetarian diets and vegan diets, I, you know, in fairness to vegetarian diets, which, which I say that as a distinction because it includes dairy, when that dairy comes from grass-fed animals, pastured animals, it can contain adequate amounts of DHA. But when it's coming from animals that are fed grains, remember, these are the same oils I was just describing that are in grains, right? So when animals are raised on grains, they end up concentrating in their body those polyunsaturated oils rather than DHA, which is this long chain omega-3 fat that is in our brains and the brains of animals. It's in the body mass of animals. And in particular, it's very rich in marine animals. And that's why we think about, when we think about DHA, we often think about fish. Uh, from the ocean, we think about fish eggs, we think about cod liver oil. These are oils that uh, marine animals use in their body because these oils stay very liquidy uh, even when they're cold. So if you think about you know, a fish oil, you put it in the refrigerator, it doesn't turn solid the way, let's say, an olive oil would or something like that. It's very liquidy. Well, that's the same oil that we need for proper brain health. A significant portion of our brain is made out of that people can live for some period of time without it. Because, and what ends up happening is it's kind of like a bank account that you keep spending, but you're not replenishing. So if you go on a strict vegetarian diet, what happens over time is a kind of cognitive decline in fluid intelligence because over time you've, you're consuming and using up this essential fat. Remember that term essential fatty acid that omega-3 is one of. Essential fatty acid, it, it's called essential because you can't produce it in your body. You, you must get it from a dietary source. You know, there are many fats that we can produce inside our body. We can produce saturated fats in our body. We don't have to have them in our diet. They're very beneficial to us. We have to have uh, long-chain omega-3 fats in our diet. We also need to have that fat, those omega-3, long-chain omega-3 fats like DHA, we need to have them in a ratio to the other essential fat, omega-6, in a ratio that's about one part omega-6 to one part omega-3 and can range as high as four parts omega-6 to one part omega-3. Well, it's important to note that modern diets can be as high as 20% omega-6 fat uh, to one part omega-3. And that's because of those polyunsaturated fats again. So those, those vegetable-based oils are very high in omega-6 fats and very low in omega-3 fats. And what ends up happening over time is that we get too much of that essential fat, not enough DHA. The omega-6 fats in excess out of balance create a lot of inflammation in the body. So we all know that's an underlying cause of many disease states. So what we can kind of directly see is that these omega-6 fats, in addition to the fact that most of them are rancid that people are eating, they're also contributing to inflammation and they are not feeding that cognitive need that we have for omega-3. So really important that we have quality animal foods in our diet, particularly animal foods that uh, are either wild in origin or if they're domesticated or raised in such a way 
that they were able to eat a diet that's fairly natural for them so that they have the suite of fats that we need in order to develop healthy central nervous systems. So for people who are going to their butcher, one thing that they could really ask their butcher and really focus on is, has this animal been fed their natural diet? Would that be what you would recommend? That would be a a step on the journey that I would recommend. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that that's a really important piece. I think it's really important that we imagine that a diet of hunted and gathered food is our ultimate goal, even though most people will never go anywhere near that, might never hunt, never gather in their lifetime. But I say it because if that's the goal, the end state, then we always have, we're always going to be tracking movement toward it, even if it's super, super subtle. Um, And even if we never really go down that road, because if we don't, it's really easy to stagnate and backslide. Going to the butcher and asking that question opens you up to being lied to. And many people are being lied to about that. I'm in the food industry to some degree because I have a, you know, a nutritional supplement food company. So I know how rife that industry is with lies. Also, I'll point out that your butcher, and unless you have a very close relationship with this person, they have a financial incentive to lie to you. So you want to make sure you're working with somebody you can really trust. You want to know that who they trust, who they're buying from, because they might be like, yeah, this is grass fed because they might be getting lied to. You know, there's a lot of misleading stuff going on in the food industry right now. For example, you know, you would want to ask the same thing about a fish, right? Is this a wild caught fish or is this a farmed fish? But one thing that's been revealed in recent years is that many so-called wild fish on menus and in fish markets are actually farmed fish and that there's just being they're they're either lying at the market level or their buyers are being lied to. What I would suggest is that the first step is definitely checking in with your butcher, but beyond that, it might make sense at some point to go around your butcher to direct to growers and make relationships with farmers themselves. So one thing I've done here where I live in the past, you know, uh, now I'm able to harvest my meats from my landscape, which is a tremendous blessing. And I know it's not something that most people really feel they have access to, although I think most people have more access than they realize, but, um, but most people feel it's a little out of reach. In the past, what I would do is go direct to the farm and purchase the animal myself. And usually I would go make that a business arrangement with them far prior to the actual slaughter of that animal, such that you can go to a farm sometimes and say, I, you know, this is the cow that you're going to get, you know, like actually like see the cow that you're going to get or see the sheep or see the goat that you're going to get. Um, and then you can still use your butcher cause you're going to need that animal cut eventually. Right. But buying a whole animal or buying the side of an animal, in other words, a half or even a quarter uh, of an animal up front from the farm sent to a butcher and then you pick that up now you know and you're actually going to the source because every middleman between you and the source is a potential is leaves the potential for you to get a little misled and it's not that I want to make it sound like oh, I don't trust anybody it's just that I being in the industry I know that a lot of times people are being misled and lied to you've really inspired me to dive deeper into animal products mm. so thank you for that I'm gonna really yeah. I've done a little bit of research like I've seen where the lambs and the chickens grow, but I want to really dive deeper into it because it's so important. And you're, you're so right. Like you do open yourself up to being lied to. And I wanted to just go back to talking about the oils for a minute, because almost every single restaurant and cafe uses those seed oils and people are going there and they're saying, I'm gluten-free and dairy-free and sugar-free. And they think they're ordering this really healthy, delicious meal. And this is in organic healthy cafes, mind you, then they're getting this meal that is lathered in the most toxic seed oils uh, that are carcinogenic and uh, trans fats. And that is one of the hardest things for our bodies to break down. So these people that are going and they're thinking they're being so healthy by ordering gluten-free and sugar-free, their food is lathered in these trans fats. And I hardly ever eat out, but very, very occasionally I will go and eat out and whether it's a birthday or something like that. And I'll ask them, I'll say, what oils do you use? And they'll tell me, they'll say, we use, you know, canola or safflower seed or something like that. I say to them, I'm highly allergic to those oils. <laughs> I am highly allergic. Can you please cook in butter or um, olive oil? And they, they say, yeah, no worries. And if oh, everyone, if everyone just started to inquire, you know, when they're going out, you're paying for this. And then when you're at your butcher, you know, you're handing over your money 
money and you're voting with your dollar. So ask the questions, be curious, because every time you hand over that money, you're saying, I believe in this product or I believe in this service. And it's really important that we start to think about that. Do you agree? I do. I do. And a couple thoughts come to mind here. One is that, you know, not only are a lot of restaurants using those vegetable oils, but I want to point out that though, when we hear that term vegetable oil, it's, it's a very misleading term because we hear the word vegetable and we think about health. So true. And you think you're being healthy. Yeah, you think vegetable oil just makes you think of like carrots and broccoli, you know, uh, but these are seeds specifically. So technically, yes, I, they are vegetal in nature. Um, but those four crops that make up most vegetable oils, canola, again, which is rapeseed oil, which canola means a Canadian oil low acid. So that's a trade name. There is no canola plant. Um, that's a, a relative of broccoli, a mustard relative. Um, there's the cotton seed. Right. So from cotton. That's actually from cotton. Oh, yeah. It's from cotton, cotton seed. Mm, great. That's healthy. Cotton, <laughs> corn, and soy. Now, the important thing about those four crops is those are principally the genetically modified foods on the market. So the Roundup ready, uh, genetically modified Monsanto crops, you know, that are really easy to highlight uh, in agriculture today cotton, corn, canola, and uh, soy. In fact, some of those over 90% of the available uh, seeds in the market are genetically modified. So not only are you getting these trans fats, you're getting genetically modified oils. Um, even when you go to the nice farm to table restaurant, and there's several reasons for that, but keep in mind too, that as you go down the quality chain, some of these places are using those kind of oils in a can aerosolized and they're spraying it onto <laughs> the pan. So you've got the, you know what I mean? The, the worst case scenario there. It's very difficult to find organic uh, vegetable oils in restaurants and such because they're very expensive and because most of what's available is genetically modified. So um, be very weary of vegetable oil and canola oil because they are a avenue through which you end up with genetically modified food in your diet. Another thing I just want to say, going back to the butcher story there, is that um, I had a guy on my show recently um, wrote a book called Real Food, Fake Food, exposing all of the food hoaxes uh, or many of the food hoaxes going on in the marketplace today, including you know, farmed fish being sold as, as wild fish, et cetera. And one of the things he pointed out is that anytime you have um, a high-priced commodity, there's going to be fraud. He was saying, you know, you get a lot more knockoff Rolexes than you do Timexes because a Rolex fetches so much money. Now, there's a tremendous premium on grass-fed meat. It's, it's substantially more expensive, which means that if I can pass off a commercial grade beef to you as grass fed, that extra money goes in my pocket. So there are many people now who are, who are butchers and who work in meat packing and such who would never think to mislead you. But of course there are people out there who will mislead you. And one of the, you know, I think going back to the kind of spirituality I was calling kind of fraudulent earlier, one of the, um, one of the things about that kind of a, that modern new age spirituality is this sort of, I'll just trust everything and everyone kind of attitude. And I think it's important that we are discerning because there are a lot of people who will take advantage of us, uh, especially when we're waving around, you know, big dollars and willing to spend that on food. So the closer we get to the source, the better. And um, the, like you said, voting with your dollar, one of the things about eating those genetically modified foods is that we're voting for more genetically modified foods. And I think most of us would like to see that phenomenon go away. Absolutely. I'm all for that. And it's interesting that you say, you know, you go to these beautiful farm to table restaurants and yes, the produce may be a lot better than another restaurant, but they use those oils. But why would they use these oils? They use those oils because they're cheap. They're cheap and they don't add flavor. They don't impart flavor to food. In fairness, as, a, as somebody who cooks a lot, lard, tallow, olive oil, particularly olive oil. Coconut oil. Yeah, coconut oil. Oh, that's a great example. Now, let, let's back up here a second and let's just talk about the qualities of these types of fats. So again, the most unstable, and when I say unstable, that means that they're prone to oxidation. Things that are stable can resist oxidation. Oils that are, are liquidy, even when you refrigerate them. So think about, you know, if you're listening now, imagine you grab the olive oil off your counter and you put it in your refrigerator. You'll see that it will turn to a gel as it gets cold. And everybody knows with coconut oil, I mean, unless it's super warm in your house, it's going to stay pretty solid. Put it in the fridge, it's like rock hard. 
At room temperature, coconut oil is is solid. At, at room temperature, olive oil is a liquid, but in the fridge, olive oil becomes a gel. Then take a polyunsaturated, olive oil is a monounsaturated oil. Take a polyunsaturated oil, like vegetable oil, put that in the fridge, it stays liquidy. Take a, a fish oil, you can't get it to turn solid. And if you could, that fish would start dying in the ocean because they would turn solid, right? And they're filled with it. So the more liquidy an oil is, the more unstable it is, uh, usually, and the more likely uh, it will oxidize in the presence of heat, light, or oxygen. So when we cook with something like coconut oil, which is solid at room temperature, it just resists oxidation. It has a very high smoke point, which means you can cook in it and the oil doesn't change. But when you take a liquidy oil, like fish oil would be a great example. You don't want any heat, light, or oxygen getting to fish oil. You you need to keep that preserved away in the dark, sealed up, not breathing, away from heat, away from light, away from oxygen. These vegetable oils should be like that too, but people don't store them that way. They store them in plastic, which breathes. Uh, they store them in clear plastic, which means they're getting exposed to light, which it tremendously increases their oxidation up to a thousand uh, times. Um, and they cook with them, which means that heat causes their, them to hit their smoke point and they start to become very rancid and oxidized. The thing about them, though, is that they're very plain Jane in their flavor. So sometimes what the cook wants, in addition to the fact that you're absolutely right, Melissa, they're very cheap, inexpensive oils, um, they also don't impart flavor. So if we start cooking with coconut oil, your food starts to take on kind of like a Thai flavor. <laughs> you're like, you really notice like, oh, there's this has got like a coconut curry flavor that happens. If you cook with olive oil, it takes on a very Mediterranean flavor. So a lot of times what they want to do is cook with an oil that doesn't impart any flavor. Now, one reason I'll say is because Modern humans are are at such a de- have reached such a degree of domestication that we're very turned off by strong flavors. Anything too bitter, anything too pungent. We start, you know, the thing about wild food that you hear from all, people all the time is like, is it gamey? Is it bitter? People are so worried about the flavors of foods. So I think chefs over time have also become very conservative with that, and they try to keep those strong flavors out. Mm, that's the medicine. Those bitter flavors. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, whenever we go to the markets, my husband's always like, yeah, let's get this bitter dandelion and let's experiment. And it did at the start shock my palate many years ago. And now I'm just like, the more bitter, the stronger, the gamier, the better. Yeah. I I tell people if, you know, you really want to improve your diet and improve your health, start to develop positive associations to mild bitterness and to mild gaminess. Um, and, and the way that I'll recommend people do that uh, is to consume foods like uh, dandelion greens, bitter lettuces, leaf lettuces, endive, things that are pungent flavors like mustard greens and arugula. You might call it, ro- you guys call it rocket there? Yeah, we call it rocket. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So rocket. And then um, I would say liver and heart are great ways that people can start to kind of get used to that what gets called gamey flavor um, in animal foods. Both of those are indicative that you're getting high quality nutrients and medicines. Absolutely. Speaking of liver, one thing I hear a lot about all the time is B12 and the importance of B12. What is the best bioavailable sources to get this in our bodies? Really no question about it. This is just animal food, Mm -hmm. (laughs) high quality animal foods. Um, There is very little B12 to be found outside of the animal kingdom. There is some um, not appreciable amounts. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of the foods that people in the vegetarian world have touted as non-animal sources of um, cobalamin or B12 are actually analogs of that vitamin. And the problem with that is that those analogs will fit the receptor sites. And so what ends up happening is that you fill your receptor sites with something that isn't biologically active B12, and that makes it more difficult to absorb B12 when you do get some. Um, I think when a lot of people know the kind of dirty secret of the vegan diet is that it uh, requires vitamin B12 supplementation. Not in the short term, so a lot of people will be like, nuh-uh, that's not true, because I've been a vegan for three years. I always tell vegans, don't even talk to me until you made it 10. Don't even talk to me yet. You know, like, like keep it to yourself. You're doing an experiment. Talk about it down the road. You can go three years without B12. It's not good for you, but you can. But eventually, that diet requires... Um, 
supplementation, often in the form of um, subcutaneous or intramuscular injections of methylcobalamin, that's because the diet lacks B12. Um, that's not even something we really need to think about when we're eating animal food. But I do want to point this out, Melissa, lest people hear me talking about animal food and, and um, don't understand where I'm coming from. When I talk about eating animal foods, I'm talking about full utilization of animals. Um, there's this, we hear that kind of pseudo spiritual myth all the time that, that, you know, native people used all of the animal. Well, that's not entirely true. Um, but most parts that were usable, uh, were used if there was a need for that. So it's not like you need every single rib of an animal to make tools or, you, you know, that's not realistic, but most of what can be eaten was eaten. So when we're talking about eating an animal, let's take a cow or deer or something like that as an example. What most people in the so-called first world are doing is eating the muscles only. And unfortunately, it leads to a kind of imbalance. So it's really important that we're also eating the what often are thought of as less desirable cuts. So when you think about the desirable cuts in an animal, it would be the loin, it'd be the tenderloin, it'd be the steaks. Um, these are cuts that are very soft and tender. The pretty cuts. The pretty cuts. Yeah, exactly. Now, the thing is, is all that is, is muscle. And it's quite acidic, isn't it? I don't want to go into whether it's acidic or not, but I'll say that it's very high in an amino acid called uh, methionine, and it's very low in glycine. And the problem with that is we need a balance of the two, and glycine is found throughout the connective tissues. So traditionally, what we'll see right up until industrialization of our diets in the last you know, couple hundred years is that cuts rich in connective tissue were cooked long and slow usually in a liquid, right? They'd be braised or they'd be done in a crock pot uh, or a soup or a stew that over time breaks that connective tissue down. The stuff that if you just tried to chew it would be like bubble gum, you'd just never get through it. But when it's cooked long and slow, those proteins are denatured that are in the connective tissue and they kind of dissolve and we get delicious pieces of meat that way. So it's really important that we're getting enough connective tissue. It's also important that we get organ meats Particularly, that would be the liver and the heart. Um, some might argue the kidneys as well, and maybe some others. But I would say, in particular, liver, which is probably one of well, amongst the most nutrient dense foods available on the planet. Uh, very, very important for us to get the fat soluble vitamins that we need in our diet and the amounts that we're adapted to naturally. So, um, and additionally, we also need the bones and the marrow and the, the fat that's inside marrow bones. So I'm talking about full utilization of animals. Uh, some animals that will include the skin. You know, we always hear that thing, right, Melissa? Like your skin is the largest organ of your body. In other words, your skin is an organ. And when we eat animal skin, we're eating an organ meat. So the skin of birds would be a great example. I think a lot of people, you know, I kind of cringe when I watch people eat like skinless chicken breast. It's like, man, you're eating the packing material. The good stuff was on the outside. Um, the skin of fish is like salmon, which are just fantastic sources of those long chain omega-3 fats we were talking about. So skin, organs, bones, muscles being the least nutritious part of the animal. Uh, but in our classist, a highly hierarchical civilized world, we've put a premium on certain cuts because they're, they're fun to eat and our diets, real, let's be realistic, modern diets are more about fun than they are about nutrition. So, so it's like, oh, the, these cuts are so delightful to eat when you're wearing a, a bow tie and you know, your elbows are off the table and you're, you've got 14 forks laid out in front of you. Um, but from a natural perspective, that only represents a small portion of what we're after when we eat animal foods. So we need the to eat that the the kind of common term we hear today here in the states anyway is nose to tail, and I think that's a really good way to think about it. And one reason I said before, let's say that we just get our meats from the butcher. Let's say we have a great relationship with an honest butcher. He is great. He or she has great cuts, and we really trust the origins of those foods. But what happens is. Every time we go to the butcher, we're getting pieces of a different animal. So let's say I go to the butcher, uh, you know, once a week for a year. Well, at the end of that year, I've probably eaten 50 parts of 52 different animals. Whereas if I go and I buy a side of beef, let's say, a side of, I'm going to eat through all of these cuts I would never have eaten before because I wouldn't go to the butcher and buy a tail. I'm probably not going to go to the butcher and, you know, buy a shank. I'm going to keep buying ground and steaks, right? Because it's easy to cook and it's easy to eat. 
But if we buy the, ha- the half or the whole animal, we get all of those cuts, which means we're going to get that, that diversity in our diet. Um, and we're only eating one animal. So for those who have ethical concerns about eating animals, but are eating animals, I would say, you know, it makes way more sense to buy one cow than it does to buy a chunk of 52 cows and to buy that same chunk over and over again. Um, I think that's a really unsustainable way to eat. So it makes a lot more sense. And, and for people who feel like, man, that's overwhelming, like a half a cow, that's a lot of food. Maybe start with like a sheep, a lamb, a goat. Get, you know, or a quarter of a cow, but that'll ensure that you get lots of different stuff and always make sure when you buy animal foods, you get the organs. I feel like, um, this summer, uh, or not this summer, sorry, uh, last summer I, uh, bought some chickens from a farm, uh, local to me and I got those chickens and I, when I looked inside, there was no heart, uh, gizzard or liver. And that's something that's usually included in the body cavity of a clean chicken. And these farmers, for whatever reason, didn't include it mostly probably because people aren't using them anymore. To me, I felt like I got ripped off. That's a, that should be included. If you buy a side of beef, you should be getting some of that animal's liver, some of that animal's heart that's entitled to you. And also I'll point out that through time, the, the heart, the liver, the, the tenderloin, these were considered the hunter's portion. These were eaten in the field by the hunters because it was understood that these made you strong and more able to uh, be out uh, enduring those long hunts. They are crucial to um, substan- the kind of substantial health that most of the people listening to this want. You can do cow shares so you could get a family and you could go halves if, if you're a bit overwhelmed with getting the whole. That's kind of what I'm talking about. Exactly. Yeah. And this is something that we've done before as well. And we eat a lot of the off cuts, a lot of offal. We very, very rarely eat the muscle meat. It's more the liver and the kidneys and the hearts and the, the brains and bone <laughs> marrow. Like we love experimenting with this sort of stuff. And For me, I went and did a cooking workshop where I learned how to cook all of these offcuts and and that really gave me the confidence to start experimenting in my own home because I was a little bit scared, I must admit. I was It's intimidating at first, right? Yeah. I was like, well, what if I do something wrong and then I poison my family? Like there was a little bit of concern. So I went and educated myself. I went and did the workshops with these amazing butchers and really experimented there and then bought it home. I think it's also a little intimidating to people because unless you grew up on a farm or you grew up in a hunting family, most of us are not used to cutting up anything that resembles part of an animal. We're used to buying a... See, I, like I noticed with my girlfriend a phenomena where let's say that I, I've brought something, let's say it's a, a fish or a, a turkey, something like that that I've hunted or fished and I bring it home. When it's in its whole form, it can be a little off-putting to people who never grew up seeing that. I don't think that's a natural thing. I think it's an un- natural thing that comes from having from nature divorcement when you know when you've spent four thousand hours sucking your thumb in front of a television screen watching like cartoon animals talk to each other when you see a, a dead animal it's pretty shocking to the nervous system because we're not we haven't been exposed to it the way we naturally would have been all throughout our history so when we bring a dead animal into the house it can be pretty shocking to people at first if they're not used to it and i think a lot of those cuts are scary because it's like you're dealing with parts of an animal that are very similar to parts of your own body i mean it's pretty overwhelming so until you kind of learn how to deal with it, it can be kind of scary and it's easy to revert back to something that looks like food so what i noticed with her is like if i bring home an animal you know she's gotten quite used to it now but as i start to peel the skin off remove the, I start to trim it. I start to butcher it down. There's a point at which it just starts to look like food that people are used to. Like when a a salmon goes from being a salmon into looking like a filet, like you could buy at the fishmonger, suddenly it's like, oh, now it's food. You know, a rabbit that's really cute and sweet looking. And then all of a sudden now it looks like a chicken. (laughs) So I think that like part of those cuts, it can be overwhelming because our limbic system of our brain, which is our emotional center, has not um, been desensitized over the course of our lifetime. And so it's highly sensitive to this stuff. Um, it's almost like a, a death reminder, and that's really shocking to people. So I think learn, getting desensitized to that is a really important part of becoming a natural person again, because I, I have a lot of children around me who grew, have grown up now around parents that have livestock or hunt. 
And they they have no emotional reaction to blood, to organs, to dead animals. They don't have that. I had that as an adult, which is a total aberration. I don't understand that now. A lot of vegans will point that out and say, well, then why are people react so strongly to this? And I would counter because people are supposed to grow up seeing it and haven't. Um, so I think, you know, as we get more accustomed to this, I think working with those, what you're calling off cuts is really good because it helps to get people, we shouldn't be disguising the, what we're eating. We shouldn't be disguising it. I think it's for us to have a full spiritual reverence for the species that we consume, we shouldn't be denying what they are. And that's a bit of what's going on in supermarkets today is like, it's all been hidden from us so that we don't have to think about where it comes from. And I think thinking about where it comes from is one of the most important. It's like, without that, we are not going to save the ecology of the planet. Bullshitting ourselves about what we're eating, we're never going to save the ecology of the planet. We need to look it right in the face. I think that's really, really important. Mm, I might send my husband and little boy over to do some hunting with you. <laughs> <laughs> that's something that Nick has has spoken about. He really is very passionate about educating our little boy on this. And, and you know, because there is times where he kind of screws of up his nose a little bit and, you know, the liver or the kidneys. And well, he's been eating liver now for so many years that he, he just knows that he's kind of over the whole, ugh, gross thing. <laughs> right. There's no choice. You eat it or you, you don't get food. You know, it's part of our life. And we eat liver every single day. Going back to what we were talking about before, I recently read the average family of four can get their entire animal product needs for an entire year year from one cow, if you eat nose to tail, and that if everyone switched to eating larger animals, the net effect is basically having to kill less animals each year. Now, do you think this could be a better solution than eating hundreds and hundreds of small animals like the chicken and fish? No, um, I don't. Uh, That's because eating a cow is not, I mean, a cow is not a natural animal. So I think that it's a, it's a, there's a social solution there, but not an ecological solution. So ecologically, and ecologically as in human ecology and ecologically as in the health of our planet, I, I just can't agree with that because we need a diversity and we need to, let, let me explain a little bit about how animal stewardship in the United States works. And we have a very unique system here, really different than the rest of the world, but we have tremendous hunting opportunity here and we have tremendous amounts of wild animals here because people hunt them. So for instance, here in the United States, when I buy my hunting license, that money goes directly to the conservation of animals. Um, And that money goes to fund the biologists who study those animals in the ecology here. Without that, that money goes away. And we end up eventually, like many other places in the world, with a dearth of game. So first, I think it's important that hunters hunt a variety of things because that actually supports in in lots of other ways too, not just our hunting licenses. There's a mandatory tax on all hunting equipment in the United States, and that money goes to conservation of wildlife. Um, Many hunters contribute extra money to conservation. Uh, When I go to hunting stores, they ask me if I want to round up uh, to support conservation. 100% of that money goes to conservation of animals. So that's one important piece. Wild lands are protected, at least in North America, through hunting. Um, And we don't see that in much of the the rest of the world. So we have a really unique system here and I really like supporting that. But the other thing is, is like, it's not natural for us to eat only one kind of animal and particularly cows, which are not a natural animal. I think families would do well to buy one cow, but cows, I don't think are going to support people's complete health needs. And for people like yourself, like there's not enough liver in one cow for you guys to eat the amount of liver you're talking about. Additionally, fish are really, really important for us to meet our nutritional needs. So I think healthy stewardship of fisheries is crucial and we need that as well. Um, I think there over time, we're going to understand because there's an emerging science that that's looking at the effect of novel genetics in our diet on our body. And I think over time, we're going to understand that eating from only one kind of species over time is not healthy for us, that we need a diversity of species. So I think it's a, I think the benefit that I see of families switching to buying their own cow is that it 
leads to more small scale rearing of cows and less of the CAFO farming uh, of cows, that high uh, intensity agriculture scenario. But I don't think that we need to be moving toward a, that just, I think takes us more towards like a Soylent Green kind of future where it's like, all you know, everything comes from one thing. I just, I don't, I don't think so. And I wouldn't want that. I'll tell you, I really enjoy the season here. It's like, you know, I enjoy the, right now I'm enjoying ice fishing and the diversity of species that I'm getting to interact with now. And then, you know, coming after that will be turkey season. And then that will be followed by bear season. And that'll be followed by deer season. That'll be followed by squirrel season and duck season. And for me, another thing that I don't like about the idea of only eating cows is that we need not just the nutrition, we need these relationships to these species. One of the things too, I think is funny about vegans is they'll talk about how they love animals, but they have very little usually, you know, I'm sure there's exceptions, but I think largely there's not much of a relationship to animals outside of domesticated animals. So most hunters have direct relationships to wild animals that most people who don't hunt just don't have. Again, there's exceptions, of course. There's biologists, for instance, who don't hunt but work with animals and have direct relationship. But most people don't have direct relationship to animals. And I think for psychological health, we need direct relationships with a suite of species. And humans traditionally get that relationship through predation on those species. So yeah, I just think it's important that we have a lot of variety psychologically and nutritionally. Mm, Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. That's really important to remember. So I have a couple of rapid fire questions. You've really inspired me so far Mm -hmm. with some things that I'm going to take out to my husband and and, uh, share with him and implement into my own life. So thank you. But before we kind of wrap up. I would love to hear what is one thing that you would like to improve or that you're currently working on within yourself at the moment? Emotionally, I'm looking a lot at um, traditional community, as in the kind of communities that existed before um, the advent of agriculture and the development of civilization in the last, you know, like I said before, six to 10,000 years. Prior to that, people lived in groups of 35 to 50 people called a foraging group. And these were incredibly intimate relationships. Um, they lived in what we know now as a gift-based economy, re- reciprocal gift-based economy, um, where there wasn't money, but there was a sort of gifting with the expectation of later receiving kind of economy. And this is transcultural around the world, we find it. Um, these cultures were animists, and that, that was their spiritual path, that, that the same life force animated all things on the planet. Um, and they lived together in, with a shared fate. And on the emotional level, I'm really looking at uh, the egocentrism that's been imprinted on me and everybody that I know through the way that we were brought up and the uh, amount of uh, individual personal ambition that I have and how do I begin to share fate with other people. So many people talk about community like, oh, I want to build a community. One of the problems with communities is that people don't really usually have shared fate. Uh, They don't have shared blood. They don't have shared fate. They don't have uh, a shared land base. And when I start thinking about having those things, it it almost triggers something in me, like an aversion to that, that I know is cultural, that comes from a world that's told me the only thing I need to think about is what I want. And so I'm really looking at emotionally, how do I be, how can I become a more more fit for community um, in its natural and traditional sense? so that I can be less self-obsessed and more community-obsessed. I, I think a lot about like how good it would feel to have people that I would really be willing to die for, that I would really go to any ends for. And our culture has made us, outside of our nuclear family, our culture has made us like so self-focused that, that most people don't really have that. Like people they outside of their kids, maybe, or maybe their spouse, maybe. Most people don't have like a a strong sense of community that's bound to place. Another thing kind of added to that is that we've all been taught that it's just no big deal. You just move around all the time. Oh, I live in LA, now I live in Bali, now I live in California, now I live in New Zealand. Like I just move all the time. But the problem with that is you can never develop a connection to ecology in any place. And so traditionally people are place-based. 
So I'm also looking emotionally at what it takes for me to settle into the place where I live without that constant itch that I got to go somewhere else. It's something better somewhere else and not here. Uh, so those are the things I'm really looking at. It's like, how do I become a better member of my human community? And how do I become a better community member to non-human persons as well? Mm, That's so beautiful, Daniel. Like it's really beautiful because I feel it. I feel it too. We don't have a lot of our blood family here in in the city that we live in. We have to get on a flight and fly to see my parents and my husband's parents and my my sister-in-law and brother-in-law and my brother. Over the years, I've really craved that tribe, that community like I want to feel like I would die for someone. And and I do with my little boy and my husband, but I totally get what you were saying. It's a nuclear family, your your husband and your child. So it's like that's that our our I've talked about this a lot on my show, so I know you've heard me say it, but it's like extended tribes um and language groups and foraging groups were broken down into clans that were broken down into you know eventually villages that were broken down eventually into nuclear families that now are being broken down into individuals so we're being cleaved away into isolation through the civilizing effect of you know agrarian living and the other thing is is that a community can't really exist in my opinion outside of a land base so when you look at traditional peoples they often are named after what they eat or where they live right so it's like we are the people of the sea i've been watching a lot of stuff about uh, inuit people uh in uh, northern canada you know and like the people of the seal it's like we are of this place and of this food and I, I was listening to a story today about some of the first European contact and the, the Europeans took an individual on their ship by force to bring him back to Europe. He bit his own tongue off and killed himself oh my gosh. being stolen away from his people in his land base, right? And it's like most of us don't have a connection to a place. The the way it is today, wherever you go on the planet, it's just the same. It's the same stores. It's the same stuff available. It's the same clothes. It's the same climate. We might go to a place that's a desert, but inside our houses is always the same. Inside our stores, it's the same. Inside our malls, it's the same. Inside our cars, it's the same. So we start to forget about the environment and that we're a part of it. We start to think we're not. So a lot of times when people are thinking about community, they're thinking about social community, but not ecological community. And those two things need to be bound together. So it's not just the people you're with, but it's the place where you're with those people. And if we're really going to ever have natural lifestyles, we can't be moving all the time because if I leave right now and I go, you know what? I feel like living in Montana now. And I move there. I've got to learn plants again. I've got to learn animals again. I've got to learn seasons again. I have to find springs again, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I can never actually be enmeshed into a landscape. But modern humans have this itch that's been put on us that we just got to move and go and always be changing. And I think that's a really toxic thing, but I think that's really plays well for marketeers and corporations that constantly want to leverage us for our labor and for our money. And they want us to feel this way. And it's been encouraged because it makes us better consumers because that lack of community, we're always looking, 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 buying, purchasing, going here and there because we never feel content. So, so I, again, back to what I was saying before, emotionally, I'm like, where, where do I find contentment if not right here? Yeah, absolutely. It's that whole, you know, the grass is greener. And when, you know, oh, well, I'll just move to LA and then I'll be happy. Yeah. Where you, where you are, it's like, you're in Australia, right? Yes. I mean, those, 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 Indigenous people of Australia have been there for, I hear ranges of estimated ranges of time, but something like 65,000 years they've been there, right? Knowing that landscape so intimately, so intimately. I, I have a hard time being anywhere for more than a few months. You know what I mean? Mm. So, so I'm just really fascinated by that idea of, you know, generationally knowing a landscape that intimately. And and I've moved to where I live now fairly recently. So I moved here about a year and a half ago uh, to the place where I am now. You're still and in Maine? I'm in Maine. Yeah. And I think I'll stay in Maine. But, you know, uh, I'm where I am in Maine. I was in Maine before, but I moved to a new area of Maine. And I'm hunting and fishing with a lot of people here who were born here and have never really left here and have grown up here. Their knowledge of uh, creeks and rivers and lakes and mountains and where this lives and where that lives and how to find this and that is so tremendous. I'm aware that I'll never, ever, no matter how long I live here, I'll never have that kind of knowledge of this place. 
And that's a tremendous disservice to me as I procure my food on the landscape. You can imagine the better you know your landscape, um, the better you can forage it. And so since that's kind of my goal, I'm behind the curve a little bit because I've bounced around a lot. And so, you know, I can learn a lot about this place, but I'll never know as much as people who are native to this place. Mm, So true. And we're really good at creating these online communities, you know, building the tribe online. But how is that different to being in person? It doesn't even compare. People stay in these communities as long as they're being stroked nicely and petted. But as soon as there's any uh, drama that emerges, people bail because, or they fight, um, because there's really no shared fate. There's really nothing linking people together, but some ideology or some ism or some shared interest in quilting or whatever it is that, that brought those people together. Um, so we delude ourselves, I think a little bit in that, like we it's a surrogate community. It's not the real thing. It's kind of like, um, taking B12 supplements instead of eating animal food. It, might keep you alive, but it, it won't ever nourish you enough to thrive. And we use the word community very lightly today. That was amazing. And, and it's really, really pulled on my heartstrings because it's something that's so important to me and something that I've been really pondering a lot lately as well. So let's pretend you have a magic wand and you could put one book in the school curriculum of every single high school around the world. Now, besides your own book, what would be one book that you would put in the school curriculum? <laughs> well, I've got this friend, Arthur Haynes. Um, I've mentioned him before. And, you know, if I have a community, he's <clears throat> definitely an elder in it. And uh, he's a botanist, a taxonomist, a primitive skills guy, another hunter, fisherman, forager. and. Um, you know, a botanist by trade, so a scientist. And he just finished uh, a book. He's written many books, but he just finished a book called A New Path. uh, And we are in a book club right now. So I'm actually helping support the distribution of that book online through this. So I'm reading that book now. So it is uh, basically a manual on rewilding and why. And I've been talking about this subject for a lot of years, and I'm probably one of the most forefront people talking about rewilding. Uh, So reading his book's been amazing because he says a lot of things, and I think a lot better than I can say them, and and backs them up with a lot more science than I even know where to look for. Uh, So his book, which is uh, forthcoming, would be one of them. Um, I would put the book Nutrition and Physical Degeneration in the hands of a lot of people as well. That book really, really influenced me. I would put the book Ishmael in some hands as well. That one really impacted me when I was a kid and what got me on this path. So there's a there's three. Those three books sound amazing. Let's talk about how your day looks. I am fascinated by people that I love and admire and their morning routines. So can you give us a little bit of a rundown on how you prime yourself for your day? I do. I want to kind of add the caveat that it changes a lot uh, and it shifts a lot based on what's happening. It brings me back to kind of what we're talking about before. Modern indoor living, right? That 95% of our lives, uh, everything's the same all the time. So nothing's changing. So it's easy for us to be like, what's your morning routine? Unchanging all the time. But I live in a place where we have four seasons. You know, it's dark here right now as we're talking. It got dark here at about 4.30 p.m. today. Uh, But in the summertime, it's not going to get dark until 9.30 p.m. Um... Some mornings I'm getting up at three in the morning to go fish or hunt. Other days I don't have to do that. So it shifts tremendously based on what food I'm chasing down or or foraging. It changes based on the seasons and the weather, et cetera. So I just want to add that caveat. And I think it's important that we're fluid in that way and adaptable uh, because when, you know, naturally we would get up, you know, or with the sun, but when we look at clock time, the sun, when it comes up, unless we live on the equator, that's changing every day. So with that said, I like to get up first thing in the morning. I kind of come out into my kitchen and I start um, boiling water. And that's because I'm going to be making tea of some kind. And then I'm going to be blending that up, making my morning drink. I get that happening right now. I'm sitting down to read for about 30 minutes or so. Um, that shifts and changes, but that's what I'm doing right now. I mentioned I was in this book club. 
I've got to get my workout in kind of early. I hate to use that term workout, but I do a lot of movement programming. So training my body to be more adaptable and resilient in natural environments. So I do a lot of mobility work. I do a lot of programming movement. Um, And when I say programming movement, it's like practicing falling, practicing getting up from awkward situations, practicing um, how I'll move outside. So I do a lot of training like that first thing in the morning. And I like to get like a sweat going. Uh, That really primes me for my day. So that stuff's all really, really crucial to me. Like if I don't have uh, my, my morning drink and if I don't get my training session in, I notice that I'm way less productive throughout the day. After that, I start checking in with people. I'm really careful about social media early in the morning. I'm careful about computers, phones, any of that first thing. I don't touch any of that. And I also want to say that I don't, um, I don't touch that until I've done the things that I do for myself first. So I really see, it's kind of like with money. I think it's really important with money that people get in the habit of paying themselves. Most people don't do that well. Some people call that saving. I don't think of it as saving. I think it's just paying myself. It's kind of like that. It's like with your time, you got to first give yourself the time you need so that you then have time to give to other people. So I run a company. I have a staff. Um, I don't give my attention to those people that be my my team or my customers until I've taken care of myself first. And that's really crucial. And I want to say one more piece that I don't wake up early unless I'm uh, I have something I'm doing. I really don't think I'll look back on my life and think I should have got up every morning at six or five or four. (laughs) Um, I really believe that adequate sleep is one of the most important um, aspects of our health. And um, I'm very, very vigilant about uh, protecting my sleep space. I've invested more in my bed than most people probably ever will. Um, I've in- I know I'm so jealous of your well, Samina. Yeah, yeah, one. Yeah, one. Yeah, I mean, that's really made my life um, a lot uh, more pain-free. But but I, I've invested a tremendous amount in my sleep. So I wake up um, without alarm clocks almost every day of the year. Um, unless I have, like I said, if I'm going to go hunting and I got to be up at three in the morning, okay, I'll set a clock. But, but I like to get up when I'm ready to get up. And so what I'm doing the night before will really determine when that happens. But from there, it's like right to making my drink. It's right to my mat. Um, a lot of times it's meditation right now. I'm reading in place of that, but a lot of times I'll sit 15 to 20 minutes and just in quiet in mindfulness. That's another really important thing for me. So, um, but the main, the main takeaway of it is that I think that the morning belongs to me and I don't give it to anybody else. Um, and I don't give any energy to anybody else until I know that I'm in a stable enough place to, to share myself mm, with the world. So beautiful. Thank you. And you've touched on so many amazing mm-hmm. points. I loved that. Thank you. You've inspired me too with my morning routine. I'm going to mix some things up and I always put an alarm on. We've got a, a sun lamp. Most of the time I, my body just naturally wakes up, but um, sometimes we have to put an alarm on and it's so much nicer when you can just let your body. Some people might be hearing me too and being like, yeah, this guy doesn't have kids. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, I'm saying all that and then I'm hearing you and I'm thinking, well, yeah, I, I don't have kids, so I don't have, you know, I'm not responsible or beholden to, you know, the welfare of a child when I wake up in the morning. And I think, should I have kids at some point, that'll change my morning routine a little bit. Uh, so I, you know, I don't say it to like narcissistically, like, oh, the morning's about me. It's just that I don't have anybody else I have to take care of first thing. Yeah. So what are three things you're most recently grateful for in your life? Like I am a massive advocate for gratitude. So I'd love to hear three things that you're most recently grateful for. Well, I'm really, really grateful for the salmon I caught yesterday. Um, <laughs> I really am. I, I've been salmon fishing and, and to me, salmon is, is this, uh, just one of those totemic animals of, uh, the environment where I live and I'm pretty new to the world of hunting and fishing. And so I've been catching salmon, but never a salmon that was of legal length that I could keep and eat. And, uh, and so I caught one yesterday, 17 inches and, um, the requirement where I was fishing was 16 and I was able to bring that animal home and, uh, share it with a friend, uh, before, uh, the, my friend Arthur, I was talking about before recording a podcast and, uh, that meal, to share it with somebody who appreciates that species. So not that food. I'm not talking about, oh, it was great to have that pink meat. I'm talking about looking that animal in the eyes, you know, meeting that species face to face and developing that connection. It's one more, when I walk through a natural environment, it's like, it's like when you plant, I plant forage and I hunt mushrooms as well. When you walk through the forest or you walk through a field and you see plants that you work with as medicine or food, 
it's so, that's why I said non-human persons. It's like, I see dandelions like a non-human person, you know, Sam, it's a non-human person. And when I see those species that I work with, it's like a friend and it makes, it, it's a reminder that I'm not alone in this ecosystem, right? Because it's so isolating in our social environment sometimes, but um, but out there, it's like I have these connections to these powerful spirits, these powerful totemic animals. So I was just so grateful to come face to face with with this animal um, in a way that I had really, really hoped to. Um, I'm incredibly grateful to my partner, Ivani. Uh, just I have this amazing relationship emotionally, sensually, sexually, romantically, um, as a helpmate, as a, a partner in, in how I live. And I'm really grateful for the way that the... Uh, especially in an environment right now, which is trying, I mean, I don't know what the climate's like in Australia, but here in the States, there's, there are people actually saying that there is no such thing as biological gender. I just can't even believe the absurdity of this argument. It makes no sense. And I'm supposed to not notice gender anymore. And I'm not supposed to differentiate between male and female. Well, I just will go to my grave rejecting that silly notion. And I'm so grateful for the polarity between men and women or masculine and feminine, however that works for people. And I'm just so grateful that there is a feminine force that can balance my masculinity because I would burn myself to the ground without that. Uh, So I'm just really grateful for the healing balm of feminine love. Um, and I'm also really, really grateful to, um, my elders, my ancestors and, uh, those people who are teaching me in the world. I'm not an easy student. I'm a great student. I learn fast, but, uh, I'm not an easy student to deal with. And those people who teach me, I'm just so grateful right now in the world of hunting and fishing, uh, foraging, gathering, there are people who show me the way, and I didn't know how to walk in the world before that. So. Um, being taught by people who, who've learned the knowledge before me and just witnessing the value of elders and beyond that, my ancestors, I'm just incredibly grateful that I'm not alone, that we're not alone, (laughs) that not only are we not alone, like in this moment on earth, but we're not alone in the non-linear time dimension because we have our ancestors before and those who will come in the future and we're just sandwiched between them. And I'm just grateful for the way that that death and rebirth works and that this, this life is so rich, it's such a rich tapestry of life forms, both human and non-human, and we all pass and more come and more passed before us and more came before us. And there's a, a, a tremendous comfort I take in the knowledge that I'm just, in, I'm, a, I'm a thread embedded in that tapestry. I've got full goosebumps. That was really beautiful. In your opinion, what is one of the most important things that we could do for our health today? Something that people can kind of implement today? Pick a kingdom of life. Life that you'd like to acquaint with. So kingdoms would be like animals, plants, fungi, bacteria. Pick a kingdom of life, then pick a species and go meet that species. So you might be like, all right, for me, it's going to be apple or for somebody else, it might be salmon or somebody else, it might be kangaroo, whatever it is, go meet and eat that species. <laughs> go meet it because it's, it's like, it's not the same when you buy it. It's not the same. Go where that creature lives. Meet it on its terms and approach it with not that begging humbleness of new agey people, but with the spiritual humbleness of a a native earthling. Go meet that species where it lives, develop relationship to its ecology, and take its fragments of it into your body and, and make it you. Make it yourself. And then be an advocate for that species. I, that would absolutely transform your life. And then build on that. It's like a Rolodex of them. And then the next species, then the next species until you are connected to a web of life that currently you're not connected to. Beautiful. And what is one of the most important things that we could do for our wealth? Oh, that's a really good question. So I'll go back to what I was saying before, which is pay yourself. Um, I don't, this, the idea of savings doesn't work for me because it's like, the idea of like such a future projected way of living. But I think taking, knowing that some percentage determine what that's going to be of all the money you make, if it's five cents on every dollar or three cents or 10 cents, I think a good place to start is 10 cents on every dollar. 10% of your earnings pay yourself um, because most of the money we make gets paid out to other people. So we never really get to have it. Um, but I think it's really important that we pay ourselves because I think it's demonstrative 
to the power of our universe that we value ourselves and um, we value our labors and we value our life energy. And beyond that, I would say start finding ways. Um, and there's so such an infinite amount of opportunity right now at this time in history, more opportunity than has ever existed. Find a way to get out of selling your life by the hour. Good one. I love it. And finally, what is one of the most important things that we could do for love? <laughs> People aren't really um, very vulnerable when they communicate. And there's a lot of talk about communication and vulnerability, but most people are not walking in. I think that progressively opening up, there's all these things, you know, I, I, one way to say it would be like, you know, sometimes like you, you do something and then you look back and you realize there was a voice in your head telling you you shouldn't do that, but you denied that that voice was there um, until after. And then you can see that that voice was there in retrospect. Similarly, we have something going on with communication. We have stuff that is coming up for us internally, but we're not ever sharing it with our partner. Starting to look at when that voice is saying something's not right, there's something you're not comfortable with, there's something you need to share, there's something you need to get off your chest, you just are irritated when the person does this, or you wish that this would happen, whatever it is, all that stuff. It's really easy to treat our partner as if they're hearing the internal voice that we have and holding them accountable for not honoring our internal voice and not ever realizing we're not actually sharing that. So I think a lot of the problems people are having is because they're not actually communicating. So there's all this, like I said, there's all this talk about communication. Start looking at how to share those intimate details. And you don't have to, that don't mean just blurt everything out. I mean, sometimes you got to be strategic in how you share things, but starting to let people actually let people in to the deep inner workings of your of your your personality uh, goes a long way and then that person can do the same thing and before you know it you have a bond that is much stronger i mean most people's relationship bonds are so weak so weak and fragile so i think about becoming robust and anti-fragile with my partner so that we are unassailable. And to be unassailable, you've got to have this sense that I have shared more with this person and this person shared more with me than anybody. I mean, that should be that. That's just how it should be with your partner. Because if you don't have that, it's like kind of what I was talking about before with a lance, like moving all the time. We have that with relationships too, like always ready to split and always ready to run off. Um, the more, it's like I said before, the more I get to know the animals and the plants and the fungi and the lakes and the rivers and the mountains and the streams here where I live, the less likely I am to leave them. And in your relationship, the more you share intimately, the less likely you are to run away as soon as things get tough. And they will, as everybody knows, get tough. But I think deep, deep intimacy, real intimacy, letting somebody into your inner process is build, builds bonds that, that, are, that are really unassailable. Oh my gosh. You made me emotional saying that. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got goosebumps all over me. It's just so beautiful. <laughs> my heart is just honestly exploding with love and gratitude for you. Oh. <laughs> and I'm so grateful for all the work that you do and everything that you put out. I love following you on social media and seeing what you're getting up to and um, staying in touch via that way. Um, and I just want to say thank you and express my gratitude for your sharing so openly, so vulnerably and so lovingly and just from that beautiful, authentic space. So I'm really grateful. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Melissa. I'm really happy to be here and share with your audience. Thank you. Holy smokes, isn't he amazing? Seriously, he is definitely one of those people I want to have dinner with. You know how everyone says, who is the top five people you'd want to have dinner with in your life? He's one of them. The conversation would just be epic. So there's so many things that I learned from this interview. And a few things that I'm going to implement are I'm going to definitely start asking more questions at my butcher. And I'm even going to try and go straight to the source. So that's going to be some of my research for the rest of today. I'm going to look at going straight to the source and really knowing where my animal products come from. And I also want to be more mindful of being here and creating more community where I'm at. I have the tendency to want to move to LA or move to New York, but I'm really going to lay those 
firm foundations and start to cultivate and create a beautiful community of people where I'm at. So I hope you guys learned lots. If you did, jot it down and implement it into your life because nothing changes if nothing changes. And if you loved this episode and got a lot out of it, please subscribe and leave me a five-star review because that means that we can inspire more people together. And please share this with all of your friends. There's so many nuggets of wisdom and information and knowledge that we need to know. So please forward this on to all of your loved ones. And don't forget to tell me on Twitter who you would like me to interview and make sure you tag me. My tag is at Mel underscore Ambrosini and the person you want me to interview using the hashtag the Melissa Ambrosini show. And for everything that Daniel and I mentioned in the podcast, please head to www.melissaambrosini.com forward slash 10. And you can also check out all my other episodes at melissaambrosini.com forward slash podcast. Thank you so, so much for being here, for wanting to be the best version of yourself and for showing up today. You seriously rock. You inspire me so much. I love people that are just so willing to grow and learn and evolve. And if there's someone in your life that you can think of that would really benefit from this episode, please, please, please be a doll and share it with them now. And until next time, don't forget, that love is sexy, healthy is liberating, and wealthy isn't a dirty word.